Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India number 7 in the series on fintech. My name is Dr. Sudhendar Hanumantarao. I am the Dean of Faculty of Management and Commerce at Manipal University, Jaipur. In the first part of this series, we looked at the basic concepts of uh, <coughs> fintech, what is it, how it makes difference and things like that. Next three lectures we devoted towards some of the key concepts, key factors, key technologies which affect fintech. One is about money, one is about uh, risk and one we had lecture we, are, we had on cryptography, which is the foundation of all that fintech does today. Next we moved on <coughs> and started looking at various domains of fintech, where fintech has made a difference, new products and new systems have come in and <coughs> we started with an introduction on payments, because payments are probably the largest part of fintech, not just that payment, payment the concept of payment making sure that products sold and services sold are paid for is the foundation of all business and commerce. Without payment systems working, we cannot really do business. So, we looked at that and we looked at one of the biggest sectors of payment that is card based payments, credit card, debit card, affinity card, corporate card, charge card. These are still among the biggest payment systems in the world and in some of the more advanced countries, card, card based systems are the largest systems even today, even though other forms of payment systems are growing, getting market share. As of now, card based systems are still the largest components. Today, we will look at the emerging part of payment, emerging type of payment. In fact, it is not just about payment systems, there is there we have what are what are we called person to person systems. We will look at both P, P2P, it is common, commonly referred to as P2P, person to person, we look at person to person payments and person to person lending also, not just payments. And <coughs> one of the things that we discussed in earlier part while talking about fintech as such is that number one, it is disruptive technology that is it disrupts the way we do business. We will see especially in the case of P2P lending, how fintech has disrupted banking. Lending has been traditionally the forte of banking other financial institutions and how fintech is appending that, how it is changing the way lending is going to grow. Not all of it, some part of it at least. And <coughs> so, and other part we look at is P to person to person payment systems and part of the disruption, how fintech has caused is that it disintermediates, it is a disruptive technology, it disrupts by removing all the intermediaries. Like in one uh, primary example I gave, instead of having this entire uh, infrastructure to manage credit cards, which we saw in the previous lecture, today it is possible to think about issuing a limited credit card with just two participating banks. They, don't, they may not even need the, the credit card intermediary like Visa or MasterCard. So, or that ent entire network of middle players who make sure that the transaction happens in a safe, secure manner can be replaced simply by means of something like a blue blockchain. So, we saw an early example of disruption. So, part of the disruption cost is in terms of removing the intermediaries from the process. That means, customer buyers and sellers interact directly. Likewise, in case of payments, the payers and payees pay to each other directly. They do the transaction with each other without a third party interme intermediating in between. So, such systems is in fact one of the disruptive concepts brought in by fintech and they are getting gaining an increasing market share both in payments and lending and we will look at a little bit about both. We will look at person to person systems and this concept, we will start with P2P payment systems, person to person payment systems, but the concept of P2P, person to person or sometimes in computing world, the same thing is called peer to peer. For example, some of you might have used uh, uh, something like uh, uh, BitTorrent, some of you might have used BitTorrent to download the uh, files, BitTorrent is what is called a P2P system, peer to peer systems. We download a given file from those people who may have it. And while we are simultaneously downloading that, as we download pieces of that file becomes available to other people. 
So, we can be both simultaneously downloading and uploading bits and pieces of a file and we may not be downloading it from one single source. We will download it from any number of sources where a file is broken into a number of pieces, each piece is available. So, we directly send it to them, you go do not go through a server. My system, my desktop or a laptop acts as, as its own server. Once I have fully downloaded a file, you may see seeding it says. Now, I am acting like a server making my file available to others. Likewise, others make their files available to everyone else. So, we all share, share files with each other. So, BitTorrent is a good example of such a peer to peer system. That is the term used in the computing world. In the real world or in the financial world, we call it as person to person system. Concept is the same. Concept is quite old and it is being used in many systems. Exact example distributed systems like networking, torrents, even a cryptocurrencies, most of the cryptocurrencies based on blockchain also work on a peer to peer system. If a transaction gets updated in my database, I share it with others and they will update it into their systems. Meanwhile, somebody else may have a different transaction updated on their system, I will download that and might make my database up to date. So, this concept of peer to peer or person to person is there in quite a few domains, now it is being applied in the field of uh, finance also. And it P to P refers to the concept, the technology and the systems built on it. Like for example, many of the P to P systems are built, payment systems are built on the P to P concept or the technology which helps us share with each other. Here the dealings are direct between participants, there is no central node. This is one of the key concept, foundational concept of P to P, there is no central resource. It applies in cryptocurrencies too by the way this person to person or peer to peer, dealings are direct between any two parties. In fintech that means, customers and suppliers, buyers and sellers deal, payers and payees deal directly, there is no middleman or mediator. However, many times some of the companies may provide a platform for us to meet. Like it is it is like the old days where we would meet in a marketplace, buyers and customers they buy directly from each other. Similar to that, somebody has to give that open space to do the market. They do not do the transactions, transactions always between uh, the weekly mailas we used to have in various villages. Buyers and sellers interact directly, somebody provides the ground to do that. So, likewise many technology companies might provide a platform to do the P2P transactions. Typical examples include payments, for example, our Paytm, it is a peer to peer payment system. Lending, crowdfunding, cryptocurrencies are all examples in the fintech world of P2P systems. So, we will take a deeper look at each of these. So, why are they important? As I said, this is an emerging part of technology, this is an emerging part of fintech. It is going to is playing an increasingly bigger role in terms of both payments and lendings. In India, Today, the biggest standards, not necessarily the platform, biggest standard for doing P2P is unified payment interface. We will look at it a little bit in more detail. It is a matter of pride, I must say. It was developed in India, being copied by other countries too. That has become one of the standards for doing P2P payments. And by this is the, the amount, the transaction is growing may using UPI standards exponentially, as you can see. In 2018 and 19, 12 billion rupees worth of transactions were conducted. UPI is not meant for P2P alone, but P2P is the biggest application of UPI. There was 12 billion rupees worth of transactions conducted using UPI in 2018 and 19. It is already quadrupled in just 4 years to almost 46 billion, expected to quadruple further in another 3 4 years to 201 billion. So, P2P payments are increasing exponentially. And this is here is one more graphic, P 2 P it is a natural fit, P 2 P can be done on many platforms like for example, BitTorrent works on my laptop. But the most natural and increasing use of P 2 P is from the mobile, mobile platform. Here is an example from the US, amount of transactions in 2023 on P 2 P mobile platform is estimated to be around 612 billion dollars. Right now, it is almost 500 billion dollars which has doubled in only 3-4 years. 
this is the rate of growth that is coming down, but the number amount of transactions is increasing. And we saw that yesterday total total world transactions is expected to be about 2 to 3 trillion in payments and mobile transactions alone P 2 P are almost a quarter of that. So, it is a growing part that is why P 2 P is very important. It is the fastest growing segment in fintech, number of customers is increasing, number of transactions are increasing. The platforms, products, standards are all evolving very rapidly, new and new platforms are coming, new and new standards are being developed and new products for using P 2 P technology are constantly entering the market. So, let us look at a little bit like, like with in other cases, let us look at a few basic concepts and definitions. P 2 P also referred to as peer to peer system, uh, now in our case we will talk to the, we will refer to it as person to person because it is people who are using these systems in fintech. P person to person payments, we are talking about payments now, we talk about lending later, allow you to transfer funds from your bank accounts, credit card, even wallets to another individual, it could even be a company. There are there is a concept now coming called P 2 M, merchants also can open their P 2 P account. So, while we buy something, we as persons pay to merchants. So, that is referred to often, you may see the term P 2 M, the concept and technology are the same, just that the receiving party is a merchant rather than a person. Where is it useful? Person to man, merchant we can see, where is person to person useful? Suppose somebody wants to borrow 2000 rupees from me. It is much more easier for me just to send this, that person may be in a different town, it is too small an amount to make a check, send it to him, he puts it in the bank, I can just simply transfer 2000 rupees from my account to his account, which is available to him instantaneously. Even better account, uh, especially in students, college campuses, especially in the US, when we all go out for dinner or some co collective activity like that, at the end of the meal, we all divide the bill into various parts. If there are 8 of us, we divide the bill accordingly. This concept is called going Dutch. We do not, no, when some person does not treat the others, all of us pay for ourselves, but we get a common bill. Imagine how we, how difficult it was in the old days. Somebody had to take the bill, go through the calculations, do the math and say you pay so much, you pay so much, you pay so much, you pay so much. And now none of them have the exact change, they have to do interchange, big nuisance. Now I use a P 2 P system, do the calculation and say you pay so much, so much, so much, so much they all transfer the money to me, whatever they owe. So, even in simple social setting, a P 2 P payment system is so useful, it has made life so much more convenient. It is not necessarily for transactions, it is even for simple trans simple exchange between friends who are out to have a good time in a restaurant. So, this, this is the level, this is the importance of P 2 P, it has brought convenience to even our day to day activities and refer to as person to person transfers or peer to peer. P 2 P when we say we mostly mean technology, but today as I said it refers to products and standards and everything. It is predominantly on mobile platforms, it can be on any platform, but payments predominantly have been on mobile platforms <coughs> in the form of apps commonly is running on mobiles, e wallets, these are some of the technologies that he uses, QR codes, you know many shops display, Paytm accepted, Google Pay accepted. Um, it is cash accepted with that dot 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 thingy. So, we just have to take a picture of it, we just have to point the camera, it reads and gets all the details of the merchant from that, that is called a quick, quick response code or a QR code which has revolutionized this whole gamut of authentication. Phone numbers, sometimes you can transfer by phone numbers, it also uses the mobile's data, if the mobile system, if my mobile does not have the data, um, data capability will not be able to use this. So, some of the technologies used are mobile platforms, apps, e-wallets, QR codes, phone numbers, data are all used in a seamless integrated manner. We do not even need to be aware that my smartphone is doing all these things, is using all these technologies. I just scan it, pay the enter, enter my pin, done. That is the wonder of P 2 P and the convenience, importance rather. Typically, we can have a wallet, we can store money on my smartphone in a wallet or I can link it to a bank account, I can use a P 2 P app to make the payment and my bank account gets charged immediately. Security as always is provided by, when we are sending all this information from my mobile to a server to somebody else's mobile, we need to secure, we, we do not want others to break in 
and steal that data, it is always uh, secured by very varieties of encryption. We have seen there are many varieties of encryption, all those are deployed to ensure that the transaction happens in a safe and secure manner. And this is the other important thing about P2P systems mostly, transfer and fund availability is in real time. As I am transferring the funds, the recipient gets it immediately, almost like cash. In other systems we have seen, in place of cards, in the place of cards, merchants may probably get it once a day, not immediately. In place of online transfers too, it may take some time. In, it may in, um, in the, if we issue a check, it may take one day to a week, but here the transfer is done immediately instantaneously. One more benefit of this technology. So, and the second thing is, and the other thing, not the second thing, the other thing is, most of these are apps are global in nature. If the rules and regulations permit, we can transact with anybody else in the world. There are limitations when we do foreign exchange transactions, but cryptocurrencies, which essentially also are P2P systems, are global in nature right away. We can, for example, I can pay using Bitcoin to somebody in Fiji. I stay in a, I stay in a resort in Fiji, wonderful country, beautiful beaches. I travel there, I stay in a resort. If they are willing to accept, staying in India, I can pay for that in advance using Bitcoins. So, it is global in nature. Many of the apps are global in nature. The regulations have to permit us to use them. So, these are come out the, some of the more popular payment um, uh, apps. All Apple Pay, very popular in the US. Google Pay in India, very popular. Samsung Pay is there and it is, I do not know how many people are using it. MasterCard and Visa have introduced their own P2P systems. Now that their business is under threat, remember FinTech is disruptive technology. One of the big threats of P2P systems is to credit card systems. They will, the way they work is getting at, affected. So, they do not want to be get left out of the game. They have introduced their own P2P payment systems linked to your credit card called MasterPass and Visa Checkout. Then in the US, the original pay payment system, one of the earliest ones is PayPal. WeChat Pay is in China. WeChat Pay and Alipay are both very, very popular in China. PayPal has been introduced a mobile, div, mobile app called Venmo. Venmo is a new, new, new uh, app released by PayPal came mainly on the desktop. It came on the desktop and laptop, but they have released a mobile platform, mobile app called Venmo, which has already become number one in the US. In India, we have apps like Paytm, Phone Pay, and to, to give an example of how global it is, there is a P2P app called M-Pesa. It actually can be used to withdraw money. Sometimes it can act like an ATM also. This originated in Kenya actually. Now, Vodafone in India, Vodafone Idea, they offer M-Pesa as their e-wallet, as their P2P system. It actually originated in a country like Kenya, which may be not that advanced in terms of other computing, but when it comes to mobile and P2P, Every country in the globe is a player now. They are all leveraging this technology very heavily to show the global nature. We have American companies, Korean company, Chinese company, Indian companies, Kenyan companies, all players in the P2P market. This is a typical uh, screen on a smartphone, typical P2P app screen. This is from Paytm. It has various options. We can do mobile pay prepaid, we can pay for for mobile connections by prepayment, we can pay mobile postpaid bills, we can buy insurance, we can buy electricity, we can pay for our electricity bill, we can buy movie tickets, train tickets, add money to the wallet, we can even use our credit card using P2P, we can buy groceries, we can convert wallet money, transfer money from wallet to bank, shopping, we have Paytm mall for example, so many things. In addition, the foundation of paying somebody, we can use UPI to, to transfer we use passbook, we can accept payments also. P2P is two way, not only can we make payments, we can also accept payments from others. This is a typical screen on a app screen on a uh, smartphone. That probably is one of the few drawbacks of uh, P2P that it requires a smartphone, does not necessarily work with the old uh, Symbian Nokia type phones. So, this is a typical uh, payment mechanism or the payment process very similar to all other processes too. The foundational processes do not change, but we'll let us take a look at it. This is from PayPal, the, one of the earliest uh, P2P payment systems. Person B, to whom person A wants to pay money to person B for whatever, products to be delivered, service to be delivered, what, what have you. Person B sends an account information. This is my PayPal account number to person A. Person A takes the details, authenticates. 
authenticates and says make sure that it is coming from person B, the app will do that for you, then says send so much money to this person, I am authorizing you to send so much money to this person. So, this gets deducted charged to my credit card account, PayPal used to work on credit cards, gets charged to my credit card account, the money goes to PayPal, PayPal acts like an escrow and it confirms that I have deducted money from you. Now, that confirmation comes to me and it also goes to the party, the party party who is supplying the items gets confirmation from PayPal that yes, this person who wants to buy this item from you has authorized the payment and we have taken the deposit. After that person B delivers the product or a service to person A and person B gets the uh, credit, credit gets the funds in their account. Typical except that here need to remember the whole authorization authentication is all done by us, everything is decided by us, PayPal acts only as a platform to bring us together, it takes money from us deposits there. PayPal does not do any other authentication of the transaction itself and things like that, which is even simpler in case of some of the later P 2 B apps today. It, it may vary a little bit depending on countries regulations and the actual app in process, but this is roughly the way the process works. So, where do the funds come from? I am transferring funds to pay to P, it can come from an attached wallet, I am an electronic wallet in the later part we will see a little see, see a little more about wallets types of them what is permitted things like that. So, it come, come from an attached wallet, money gets deducted, remember wallet is like a prepaid card, it is a device, it is a piece of my, it is a file in my smartphone in which details of money are stored, it will deduct that money and transfer. It can come from a linked bank account, my Paytm account may be linked to my bank account in HDFC, it may deduct from that, like a debit card or it can also come from a credit and debit card also, we can charge to my credit card and I will pay once in a month as a credit card does. Then we have the benefits of both, instant transfer as peer to peer capability as well as the credit we get and other benefits we get from credit cards. <coughs> so, why do people prefer, they have become so wildly popular, we will see one more related concept to P 2 P which is spawned is what is called micro payments, we will see who are the people who are using these P 2 P systems, the micro payments we all would have seen them, may not have paid attention, but when, when, we, when we show it, we will be surprised who are all using it, it has become wildly popular. So, in the US people were asked, why do you use P 2 P? See for us in India, we have pretty much started with P 2 P, credit cards are not that popular, in the US credit cards are much more popular. When they were asked, customers are asked, why do you prefer a P 2 P? Many of them said it gives them better security, thing is in my control. Second is peers you to use the app all my friends are using, I am using. So, when I go to a restaurant with them, since all of them are having P 2 P, it is easier for me to pay my part of the bill immediately instead of fishing out for the exact change. Some of them say this is the first app I am using, I have never used, used anything else, that is why I am using this particular app. Some men, some of them said 13 percent of them said fees, when I use credit card there is a fee, I have to, uh, for a merchant especially fees are much lower as compared to other forms of payment. For users, we still have to pay to maintain my credit card, those are much lesser in this case and some of them said, I prefer this app specifically because its user interface is similar, it is easy to use compared to other forms of payment. So, in brief that is all about P 2 P payments, but there are details and details within that, let us look at one of them. One of them is called Unified Payments Interface, UPI, it has become so popular in India, we may not even notice that. Before UPI was implemented and integrated by various apps, if I had to pay using Paytm, the merchant also had to use accept Paytm, if the merchant did not accept Paytm, I could not do that, I could only transfer from Paytm to Paytm. If I had Google Pay, Google Pay to Google Pay, Amazon Pay to Amazon Pay, now it does not matter. I can still choose to pay Paytm to Paytm only, maybe there are benefits, some points to be given or what have you, but I can choose to use UPI, one of the options you get on your uh, any app today which is integrated with UPI is make an UPI payment based on a QR code or something like that. So, using that I can have Paytm 
and the merchant may have Google Pay, I can still transfer money as if there is no difference between them. That is a revolution that UPI has brought in to the payment systems in India. What is it? It is an instant, it is it's actually started off as a standard. It said anybody who wants to do transfer using UPI have to implement these standards. These are the steps that you have to follow, these are the norms, this is the disclosure you have to do, this is the information you have to pass, this is the kind of encryption that you have to do and it has given a set of tools to <coughs> integrate UPI with our systems and it is also acting as a payment systems. Essentially it is an interface, it is a standard and all the apps, payment apps integrate that standard. They say not only do I use my Paytm interface, we can also, we also, can also use UPI to transfer money to any other app. It was developed by National Payment Corporations of India, Corporation of India, an organization set up by RBI. They have come up with other products too like the Rupee credit card, the Beam payment application, things like that. One of their key developments is this unified payments interface. It works both as P2P and P2M. Remember this term I mentioned, not only can we use this for person to person, merchants also using API may register on these various apps as merchants to receive payments. Like all P2P systems, it enables instant transfer of funds from between bank accounts too, not just person to person. Between my own two bank accounts, I can transfer funds using UPI. It works on mobile platforms. Not just in India, it is getting international acceptance. Many other countries also are trying to adopt and interface with UPI. Various app vendors are integrated with UPI. For example, Paytm is integrated with UPI, Google Pay is integrated with U UPI, I can transfer between them. It can transfer based on the quick response code, it can transfer based on the party's phone number, Aadhaar number, account number and uh, VPA, virtual payment address. We no longer do not have to worry. If you do v IMPS for example, you are required to get the party's virtual payment address and enter that. You can you do UPI also using the same. And one interesting thing the revolution caused by UPI from all other graphs you have seen that in terms of these latest payment and uh, other methods, fintech methods, other countries like China and US are much ahead of India right now. But thanks to UPI today, la this year India has become the biggest source for P2P payments in the world. The maximum number of P2P payments are happening in, in, in India in the world ahead of those other countries and a big part of the credit should go to unified payments of India, UPI. Just remember, it is just a standard to integrate between various P2P apps, but it is made a significant difference. Okay. And as I said, other countries also are trying to adopt UPI. Some of the benefits, free fund transfer, at least in theory, I can transfer funds to anyone anywhere without any fee. Useful for small purchases, this is something that we will come back again. One thing that fintech has done, especially P2P has done is reduce the cost of transactions. Remember in credit card, the fee charged to the merchant is 2 percent of the transaction. If I buy a car for 10,000 10, 10 lakhs on my credit card, we can do that. If my credit limit is high enough, the merchant is willing to accept it, I can use my credit card to pay for the car, 2 percent charge of 10 lakhs is 20,000 rupees. The charge per transaction increases, it is 2 percent and so in some of the businesses, the profit margins themselves are so thin and 2 percent goes away there. So in case of P2P, the transaction of the cost of the transaction is very low. Sometimes for us customers is mostly free, but it is still very low enough for all merchants to accept it. Third, I do not bring my bank account into the picture, I issue, if I issue a check, I am exposing my bank account. Here, thanks to UPI, my bank account is hidden, various other numbers like VPA or the other number are exposed to the client or the customer. More secure compared to other mobile systems, transfer is instant, this is something that we will constantly see. Just before I go, we will visit this point again when we come to micro payments in a later lecture. One app, many accounts, the fundamental difference, one app, but you can link it to Paytm, you Google Pay, bank account, credit card, many things. And we can choose between our favorite app. If I like Paytm, I can stick with Paytm. If I like MobiQuick, I can stick with MobiQuick. If I like M-Pesa, I can use M-Pesa. It is two-way, like all P2P systems, UPI also supports two-way transfer. 
not just that somebody has to can send money, we can also request somebody, I am going to give you this item, send me so much money. So, the process is initiated by the seller, not necessarily by the buyer. No loss of interest, money is drawn from the bank only when it is required, otherwise money stays in your, it is not like a wallet where money is staying, money can be directly drawn from the bank and of course, it allows uh, various loyalty programs like rewards and cash back. If I constantly use say for example, a given app, if I use Google app for transactions worth 1 lakh, Google pay may give me some rewards, UPI supports such systems. And these are some of the major players in terms of transaction linked to uh, UPI. Out of all UPI transactions, Google Pay alone accounts for 59 percent of the transactions. The maximum number of transactions on Google Pay and uh, UPI are happening on Google Pay and probably maximum number of transactions of Google Pay in India are also happening on with UPI. Paytm is the phone pay is the second one, 25 percent almost, Paytm is third, Beam the government's own application is next, others ICIC bank are all down the line. <coughs> the two big players are phone pay and Google pay. So, the next component, so that is about UPI, the next big aspect which affects P 2 P payments, which is a big player in the P 2 P payment are what are called e-wallets. It is it almost like, like a, you can, what is a wallet? I can pull out my wallet and I can show what all I have there. I have a driver's license, I have a credit card, I have a ATM or debit card, I have my in health insurance card, I have some cash, I have some credit card, uh, the visiting cards, I have some receipts also stored. So, that is essentially a wallet. In wallet, we use, uh, we use that to store all this, mainly finance, some of them put coins too, they have a pouch for keeping coins also, cash essentially. So, that is a wallet, e-wallets pretty much behave exactly the same way. They act as a file when we can keep, where we can keep all this information and uh, predominantly today we are using it to store cash to make payments, p 2 p payments, but they can be used for storing any other kind of information. In fact, so much so today e-wallets are defined solely in terms of money, the amount of cash we can store on them not necessary. E wallets by definition can do everything that a physical wallet can do, except they store everything information in the form of digits, not in the form of devices or cards and things like that. So, we will take a look at that, because a big chunk of P 2 P systems is based on E wallets. E wallets are the key component of most P 2 P systems, especially on the mobile platform. And E wallet are sometimes also referred to as a M wallet or a mobile wallet, because it has become so uh, predominant on the mobile platform is a virtual wallet service provided by certain service providers where people can load in a certain amount of money that can be sent, spent online or offline. As I said, we are defining e-wallets in terms of money, but theoretically they can store anything. Merchant listed with the mobile wallet service provider, it can also store other information like credit card numbers, etcetera. So, we load money into our e-wallet and we can spend that money online in a mobile platform with merchants who have registered with that platform. If I have an e-wallet from Paytm, I can store money on that, pay it at merchants who all have also have registered with Paytm. But now, just now we saw thanks to UPI, they can have a some other, some other uh, app, some other wallet, we can still transfer. The digital payments payment service works as a cashless payment service like any other form of payment system, wherein people do not have to pay cash or swipe their debit or credit cards at offline merchants. It is an online transfer using mobile and e-wallet makes that possible. In India, I mean like with everything in technology, there is so much variety of everything, it is difficult to keep track. However, based on RBI regulations, four types of wallets are permitted in India, you will see one or two types have become much more pre predominant compared to others, but four have been defined. It is called open wallet, semi open wallet, closed wallet and a semi closed wallet. Open wallet allows a user to buy goods and services, withdraw cash from ATMs or banks and transfer 
funds, these services can only be jointly launched with a bank. Additionally, it allows users to send money to any mobile number bank account, not just to the e-wallet, you can send money to there. It is like an online transfer, so what we do as online transfer using NEFT. Examples are M-Pesa by Vodafone and ICICI's wallet. M-Pesa I have mentioned earlier, it is not just a wallet, it acts like an ATM card also. That is the reason why it became very popular in certain countries, where they did not have many ATMs and other means of banking. So, if anybody want, if their relatives or somebody from the more prosperous countries wanted to send them money, they could send it to this particular wallet using which they could withdraw cash. So, open wallets allow for withdrawal of cash also other than other mobile P2P payments. Semi open wallet allows its users to transact with merchants that have a contract with the company. That is, I have the app with this wallet, I can transmit it to those merchants who have the same app, same account with the same company. A user cannot withdraw cash or get it back. We can transfer it back to our bank account, but we cannot get cash back from out of the system. He will have to spend the amount he had loaded. Example, Airtel money. With Airtel money, if you have loaded money into that, we cannot get it back. We can either have to spend it on Airtel bills or somewhere, whoever accepts Airtel, but that is all we can do. Closed wallet, a certain of amount of money is locked with the merchant in case of a cancellation or return of order or gift cards, for example, Flipkart e-wallet. Closed wallet is when not only can we pay for it, but when we return an item, money gets refunded back to the wallet, not in cash form, which we will have to spend again. Semi-closed wallet, it does not permit cash withdrawal or redemption, but allows users to buy goods and services at listed merchants. No cash, but we can use it with any merchant anywhere to buy goods and services. The example given is Paytm, Paytm is an example of a semi-closed, likewise Google Pay. So, even though they all look similar to this, to us, their capabilities are different. In India, we have already ATMs are quite popular. So, we are used to using ATM cards to withdraw money. <coughs> that is why we do not hear, hear much about a wallet like M-Pesa. It can be used like an ATM to go to a merchant, it can take money. The merchant can charge and get the money. <coughs> but in, that is why in India, semi-closed wallets, which can be used to pay for goods and services are very popular. And as we have seen, they can interact with each other today with UPI. Secondly, we do not have to store money in these wallets, we can be linked that directly to the bank account. So, here is a table comparing the various systems. Closed, these are prepaid payment instruments, these wallets are also called prepaid payment instruments PPI. I do not know why they do not call them as wallet, but it is referred to as in this document or in the, in the official documents as prepaid payment instrument. Closed PPI, only banks, NBFCs and others can uh, open, no KYC is required. The maximum amount that can be stored is 10,000 rupees. Examples include gift cards, metro card, flip card, wallet are all closed, no KYC limit on the cash. Semi-closed, banks, NBFCs and other entities, entities can release them. K KYC is preferable, but not mandated. Maximum amount that can be stored in the PPI is 10,000 without KYC, KYC 50,000 with KYC. Examples of semi-closed, Oxygen, Paytm, Mobiquick, these are all examples of semi-closed wallets. Semi-open, only banks can open, KYC is required, maximum amount we can store is 10,000. So, examples are gift card by Axis Bank, food card issued by HDFC Bank, etc. Open, wherein we can do a number of transactions. Only banks are allowed to open that, KYC is required. In India, maximum amount that can be stored is 1 lakh. Example, say, example is Vodafone M-Pesa. And this is a more detailed comparison and ratings of various uh, wallets. I do not intend to go into them, but gives you some idea of how many wallets are there in the market today. Working of an e-wallet or an M-wallet, pretty similar to everything else. Smartphone users install the wallet application on their phones. M wallet owners, we create our login account with a pin. They receive a permanent pin number for using that service. Options available from the service in include sending money to banks, money to friends, merchant payments, recharge our phone, bill payment. Remember the interface we saw of Paytm, you know the earlier slides, 
all the options are listed here. A bank account holder can load his or her M wallet through net banking, debit card, credit card or cash. Now, even that is not required. We can use this app to charge our bank account per transaction like a debit card. Earlier, we had to transfer some money from that to our wallet. Today, it is not necessary. I can link it to my savings account and money can get deducted. So, this, this step has already been outdated. So, on a per transaction basis, I can, uh, we can, <coughs> sometimes it is useful to load money into our wallet because if the connectivity is not there, if the connectivity to the bank is not there, transaction may not go through, the transaction will happen from my smartphone only. If I have preloaded some money, if connectivity is there, this step is not needed. A non-bank account holder can load his or her M wallet with cash by visiting a retail store. We can actually go to a retail store, instead of charging to my bank account, I can pay that person cash loaded to my M wallet. Cash is loaded in the wallet, the person can make payments through his mobile phone. As I said, this is one way, we can do it by linking to our bank without loading any cash also. So, advantages and disadvantages like everything. Convenience, no need to carry cash because they have become so prevalent that we can make payment pretty much anywhere using this P2P applications on our mobile phone. All we need to carry our mobile phone which we carry anyway to make calls. Access and availability, wherever there is mobile phone, especially a smartphone, P2P payments are possible. We do not need any other setup. Suitable for even very small payments. We will revisit this when we talk about micro payments. Low or no cost of transaction. Cost of transaction especially for users is absolutely 0. Ease of setup and operations. All I have to do is to download that app, create my account, log in, get the pin, done. Transactions are done on real time. As soon as the money gets deducted, the merchant gets the money generally secure. Disadvantages, possibility of human error is high. We may send the money even when, suppose we are sending money using phone number, we want to enter somebody's phone number, transfer money. We make it, we make one mistake, we enter a wrong digit, money still gets transferred. So far as I enter my pin correctly, money gets still gets transferred, getting that money bank back is much more difficult if not impossible in many of these systems. The possibility of human error is high. Remember, we are dealing with a small device, we have to type using our finger, numbers easily get changed, uh, mistaken. So, the possibility is high, especially when we are entering numbers, even digits, we may enter digits wrongly. Instead of entering 3000, we can enter the number below that 6000 without realizing. So, no easy chargeback or dispute. One good thing about credit cards is if you dispute a transaction, money gets charged back to the merchant. We, the possibility of that is much more difficult, if not impossible. Sometimes it may involve setup and loading charges, especially for merchants. Fraud and security breaches are as always common with these systems too. Two things which are today taken for granted, but in many countries still may not be available. One is you need a smartphone. Most of these apps work only on smartphones, though there are attempts to make it work on normal uh, text based phones too and we need consistent data connection. This can be a problem even in parts of India for that matter, data connection may not be reliable. But compared to advantages, it is much more minor. The convenience alone can outweigh all these disadvantages. So, that is about P2P payments. Let us look at the other big part of P2P, which is causing a bigger upheaval in the world of finance that is P2P lending, person to person lending. Peer to peer or person to person lending is a form of direct lending of money to individuals or businesses without an official financial institution participating as an intermediary. If those of you who have applied for an education loan or a home loan would realize the importance of this. If you go to a bank, they will make you fill so many forms, ask you for so many documents, ask you, ask you for so much proof, collateral, make you run around and there are various charges related to closing that loan. So, getting and after all that, they may still not sanction you the loan. It is so difficult getting a loan, getting a, a credit in India or even any other country. In fact, banks in the US explicitly charge something called a closing charge. They levy between 3 to 6 percent of the total loan as their cost. Fortunately, it is not that much in India if nothing, but the cost can also be significant. Banks to give you a loan, they charge you money between 3 to 6 percent. They call them as closing costs. So, this is, these are the, this is the current process. 
So how wonderful if I can borrow my money my, my from bunch of people who are willing to lend to me based on some collateral and lend it back to them without any of these hassles. That is the promise of P2P lending. So even though it is between two people person to person, there is, we say there is no intermediary, there are platforms which enable this to happen. There are platforms which bring buyers and lenders together. So a platform based on P2P technology may be involved in bringing lenders and borrowers together. We will see examples of some of the banks, online P2P banks which are enabling this to do, they do not act like banks, they just act like platforms. Suppose I want 10 lakhs and no individual may be willing to give me 10 lakhs, but people may be willing to lend 1 lakh each. So, these platforms bring 10 such lenders to me. So, we work out a deal amongst ourselves. They do not intervene in terms of repayment terms, interest and things like that. So, this is a typical uh, lending process the borrowers borrow money and the lenders lend after making sure that borrowers are credit worthy. So, we go to the lenders, the lenders evaluate our credit and risk management. There is a here there is a P2P platform which brings us together, the lenders have extra funds they lend it back. The platform will simply do the risk evaluation and recommend, it does not say you have to give, it just recommends and the terms of lending rate of interest and everything is to be negotiated between the two parties here. The platform simply enables them to come together. So, as always some information, P2P lending has grown. In 2010, it was almost negligible, around 2020, it has reached about 4.4 billion pounds. Very small right now in terms of the total transaction happening in the world, but the trajectory it is increasing very fast over a period of time. Another term which comes into play here, which will sound similar, is called crowdfunding. Bunch of people funding something. One of the disruptive examples I gave when I talked about fintech was crowdfunding a movie. But P2P lending also is person to person, many to many, but slightly different. So, here is a graphic to distinguish between them. Some of the these days, more than P2P lending, people are referring to it as alternative lending. So, let us compare alternative lending to uh, P2P. As you can see from the graph, P2P lending is actually a variance, variation of crowdfunding, but there is a difference. And within that there is social P2P lending also, which is a variant of P2P. Alternative lending that is P2P lending, lending that typically targets businesses and borrowers who may be unwilling or unable or unwilling to receive a loan through conventional channels like banks, uh, chit fund companies, lenders. Alternative lending often relies on digital data. These loans are often unsecured or use non-traditional collateral to underwrite borrowers. They are unsecured or they may use non traditional collateral. Typically, banks would like a fixed deposit to before giving me a loan as a collateral. They may, they may take a lien on my home. If I own a home, I can give that as collateral before borrowing a loan. Alternative lending sources they can take other means also, like they can take a cryptocurrency. You know, one bitcoin is worth almost $50,000 today. I can give that as a collateral, which banks do not accept. My money is in Bitcoin, I can give a Bitcoin or half of it or whatever as a collateral. These alternative lending platforms, person to person mainly, I can accept that as also as a collateral. They have different innovative ways for dealing with collateral, which I do not intend to go into detail here. But those who are interested, please do study some of these P2P lending platforms. They call themselves as banks, but they are not banks, they are platforms. Crowdfunding, on the other hand, is a term which describes a process of sourcing capital, it is not lending. Remember difference between lending and capital, capital is a risk, risk and reward go. Lending normally we are assured with collateral that we will get our money back. In the case of capital, it is an investment, you may get a tremendous, tremendous growth. In lending, we get a fixed income, fixed interest. In capital, it may be get enormous returns or we may lose our money also, like a stock in the stock market. It is a term which describes process of sourcing capital by soliciting to a greater pool of individuals or organizations through an online platform. Supporters may contribute many small pieces or entire sums to collectively or independently fund a project like a movie, take equity in a new company or provide business or personal loans. So, crowdfunding is a bigger uh, range of operations, P 2 P lending, alternative lending is a subset of that. This comes closer to a loan, traditional loan, 
with innovative ways of handling collateral refund return and all those things. Like in any lending, P2P lending too has three major steps. Somebody comes and says, I want a loan, I need a loan for so much money and the platform or the lenders receive the application, do the credit evaluation. What are my assets by means of which there is a, so it people lend you money only when they are sure that they can get their money back, right? So, we need to prove that if you lend me my money, your money, it will be returned back, it is safe, my credit evaluation is high. Then the loan gets closed, that means terms are agreed, we will say this money, I am borrowing 1 lakh each from 10 of you, I will return at a rate of 10,000 to each of you over the next 10 months, the rate of interest will be 14 percent or whatever, things like that. If there is a delay, this, these are the penalties, various terms we discuss and sign upon it, digitally sign. And those people lend money, till then money will be an escrow account that gets released to me. And over a period of time, I make repayments as per schedule. And if I do not make my, if there is any defaulting of the loan, the penalty clauses click, kick, kick in. And if I provide the collateral, they can start charging it against the collateral. The same thing is put it in a graphic form. The, the, lend, the borrower sends an application, the platform does the credit evaluation. It is it's, it's misspelled here, it should be evaluation. Then the credit, after doing the evaluation, once the platform is sure that I have a good credit aware profile, they post my profile to all the lenders, various lenders, they could be individuals, they could even be institutions or high net worth individuals, rich people. They will look at my profile, see my credit evaluation and they will purchase the loans. That means, they will say they will buy the loan, they will say I am going to give you your loan for so much terms and the debt, it should be debt, it is issued and the, the, and the money goes to the borrower, to the borrower. After that, the borrowers could be individuals or small businesses and in between, the platform manages the repayment. Periodically, the platform collects money from me and gives it to all these people as refunds. How does the platform make money? The platform itself, people running the platform, if they have capital, they can themselves make the loans or they will charge commissions for all these transactions. Very low cost they charge, for every repayment of 10,000 rupees, they may charge 10 rupees to collect the money and deposit it to the, likewise. So, by a large number of transactions, they hope to make their money by charging a small amount per transaction. So, this is pretty much how the new lending process goes. <coughs> Remember, the platform only does the linking between the two, does not discuss the terms and all those things and it does the credit evaluation. So, how do we compare this with a traditional bank? We have uh, savings and they make loans, this is a typ typical bank where they have depositors, we have borrowers, bank acts as the intermediary, it takes savings, makes loans. In P2P, there is a platform, it charges a commission, however, lenders lend to borrowers directly, this enables repayment, but the terms of the loan are discussed directly between these two parties. The bank, in here bank sets everything, it says how much interest we are going to give to your deposit, how much we are going to pay, charge for our loans, what is the kind of collateral required, here the parties decide that. Banks act as an intermediary between savers and borrowers, they pay interest on deposits and lend money to consumers and businesses. Marketplace lenders directly match lenders with borrowers via online platforms, they are not lenders, they are platforms. <coughs> Banks generate income by taking risk onto their balance sheet and managing the spread between interest banks charge and loans and that paid on savings. Banks make their money by what is called a spread. Today, typically for a fixed deposit, I can get expect an average of about 5 percent return, little bit depending on whether you are senior citizen and things like that, it can go up to 6 plus percent. Let us take it as 5 percent, most of the loans go for about 8 percent approximately again. So, banks lend money at 8 percent, they for deposit they take, they take pay 5 percent. The 3 percent difference between the lending rate and borrowing rate is called the spread. That forms the operating profit margin for the bank. How do these people do money? The platforms do not lend money, so they do not earn interest and do not need to hold capital to absorb any losses. In case of a default, if somebody does not pay, bank has to take the loss. So, that is why they keep capital, these people do not. They make made their money by charging a commission. This risk taking requires them to hold capital to absorb potential losses. You must have heard of the term NPA, non-performing 
assets. It is a dignified way of saying that these are loans which we have very low chance of recovering. At some point we may have to take a loss on that loan because banks act as the intermediary, they take that risk. They have to pay interest on their depositors as promised, but they have to take a risk when loans do not get repaid. Here these intermediaries, they do not put their own money, they are not lending their money, so they do not make the spread, they do not take the risk also. They make money by fees and commissions from borrowers and lenders, they act like middlemen really. Even though it is intermediation, they provide services, for that they act as middlemen, but not fully. Depositors have limited control over visibility over how their money is used. In case of banks, I do not know to whom they are lending my money. We know that bank lot of, lost lot of money in Kingfisher Airlines. My deposits may have been used, been used to give to Kingfisher, I have no way of saying do not give it to Kingfisher. Here we can control. Uh, these lenders, multi-platform lenders offer transparency and control to lenders through disclosure. I know whom exactly I am giving my loan to, what is the credit profile. So, lenders this one more form of safety, one more form of collateral where I get to decide what kind of risk I want to take. If I do not want to risk, I want to give it to those customers, those lenders, buyers, borrowers. Banks engage primarily in maturity transformation as the deposits are typically shorter than loans needing a lead for liquidity buffer. Because of the nature banks need to keep some capital, generally by design there is no maturity transformation. It is a complex term, just that to bridge the gap between depositors and lending the time this matures and the time this matures, banks, banks have to keep some capital, these platforms do not need to keep any capital. Advantages and disadvantages, advantages return higher return, uh, investors can get more return depending on the desperation of the borrower, right. So, if somebody is desperate for money, they may offer higher rates 14 percent, 15 percent plus there is no spread, there is no intermediary to take away the loan. So, if I charge 8 percent, I get all 8 percent, unlike a deposit where I get 5 percent. I can put my money in the bank as a deposit, I can lend in a mobile platform like this. In deposit, I get 5 percent, even though bank charges 8 percent, here I can get all 8 percent. So, higher return to investors. For borrowers, funding is more accessible. I do not have to go through all that merol, rigmarole, I can just float the requirement. Anybody willing to lend to me can lend to me with very little hassle. Source of funding is broad based, I am not dependent on one party, one bank, I can go to whole uh, mass of population who are willing to lend. Lower cost of processing, typical of fintech, lower rate of interest, because I get 8 percent, I can let go of 1 percent, I can give it at 7 percent and the borrowers also get it 1 percent less. Ease of setup and operations, transactions are real. Once the initial handshake is done, money gets deposited immediately generally secure. Disadvantages for the lenders, the credit risk is higher. Unsecured loans, the credit worthiness is what the platform tells me. I may not have any way of verifying that. And very few recourse in case of a default. There is no, nobody is insuring these loans. Maybe some countries are coming to that, but right now we do not. If in somebody defaults on the loan with and we turn out that turns out that the collateral was, was wrong, we may lose our money. There is no very little recourse. In many countries, there are constraints, regulatory constraints on how much these institutions can lend, how much an individual can lend just to protect investors. As always, there are possibility of fraud and security breaches, which are lesser, we hope, in the case of banks, and it may not be suitable for larger loans. Once I am not sure, maybe for small loans, 5 lakhs for one month, 3 lakhs for 15 days. These platforms are typically good for such small, small loans, not necessarily if I want to borrow a crore. There may not be many people willing to do that, I may have to go back to the traditional sources. So, in this lecture, we saw the next major component of fintech that is P2P, the concept person to person or peer to peer. It applies to both P2P payments, P2P lendings, both have revolutionized finance the way we do. P2P payments have a revolution the way we do business, where do we use it? How can we pay? Who are the merchants? Who, where they? What they can accept? And made the concept of micro micro payments completely possible. It was not possible earlier. It has made a large part of unorganized business into organized business. Whereas P2P lending is revolutionizing the lending part of it. It's making loans cheaper, more commonly available, more easily available, subject to certain terms and conditions. In both cases, there are risks and there are benefits. And more than anything else, oftentimes we are finding 
that the benefits are outweighing the, the risks. That is why both forms of financial services, payments and lendings are literally exploding in their volume and amounts. So, that is the reason why we needed to take a look at person to person or peer to peer. These are going to be increasingly important moving forward. That brings us to the end of this lecture number 7. This lecture was broadcast on channel 16 on the Swayamprabha program. Thank you.